there's your, your 4.8, that's the green, and then it's gonna take a few more years um, till it reaches up to that, that peak and then levels up, so. This was a comparison, so it doesn't matter if you're never re-exposed or exposed, um, it averages out of about 115 years before it levels off, but it's still gonna be there. Factors that may influence the rate of decay. Um, so if you sweat a lot, uh, if you donate blood or plasma, if you have di uh, kidney dialysis, Again, like I, I talked about before, your bladder and bowel activity, menstruation. That's why you know, they're still studying women to see those levels in there. Um, <laughs> it's dry material, man, I know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's not no, it's the menstruation part. Oh. No, <laughs> 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 um, So with the blood and plasma donation, the Australians did a study a couple years ago they did it over a one-year one year plan or one-year program here. They had 285 firefighters, uh, 279 were males, six females. And then as you see, 95 donated plasma, 95 donated blood, and 95 were just, they did nothing. Those were your, your, sam your, your samples yeah. Um, yeah. or your controls. So what they found is over that, that levels did decline. Not drastically, but they did decline um, for firefighters. So I had one firefighter, a civilian firefighter in the, in the military, calls me up and he's like, hey, my numbers are 35. And that was in June. And he calls me back in October. He's like, hey, I just had another blood test done. My levels are now 26. I said, the first thing out of my mouth was, did you donate blood? He's like, yeah. He goes, how'd you know? I said, that's typically what happens. I said, did you donate it regularly? He said, yeah. I said, because you donated blood, you're, because that, that PFAS is in your blood serum, that's why your levels you drop. You're like producing more without yep. the PFAS. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so give blood. Well, that's, yeah. That's and, another good reason to give blood. Well, and then we talk, we talk about that too, is that you know, how safe is donating blood if you have high levels of PFAS? That's and, safe if you're giving away. That's well, the reality is, yeah, right, if you're the recipient of the blood, I don't care what the hell's in it. I don't care if there's PFAS in it or not. If it's gonna save my life, yeah. I'll deal with it afterwards. If it moves off, you're just well taken. Yeah, yep. Uh, now I did talk to the the uh, the Red Cross, American Heart Association, you know, all those folks that you know are, are collecting blood, and I'm like, do you guys test for PFAS? They're like, what the hell is that? I says, okay, that answer, yeah, that that answer my question. question. Yeah. You know, so it's, but you know, I, I gave them a quick education on it. I'm like, yeah, maybe we should test for this and see you know, what it is. Will it be a disqualifying thing for donating blood? You know, I can't donate blood just because where I'm deployed. Uh, now I'm screwed anyhow. But um, routes of exposure, we get it through the air, soil, water. Um, as you see, firefighters down there. Uh, you guys have a policy on SCBAs? Yeah. Overhaul. You guys wear them all the time. Sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Well, what do you mean by like? Well, because overhaul is the the worst period yeah. uh, during a structure fire. Oh because, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Had yeah. Fires. we were yeah, yeah. 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 structure fires. Yeah, yeah. fires would use our space. Um, that's that's a big thing I'm dealing with up in Pennsylvania right now. Uh, a lot of volunteer firefighters up there. Their mentality is, oh, I don't see any smoke or, or fire. I'll wear my pack, but I won't have my mask on. Well, yeah. you're sucking in PFAS, yeah. you know, well, and you know, all the other personal yep. that you get with the yep. structure fire. Interesting. Yeah, I thought that was, that's been pretty well documented about how, you know, yeah. yep. bad that is. Um, chemical manufacturing through your exhaust stacks, uh, if you don't burn it hot enough, it goes straight up the stack out in the environment. That's why there's a moratorium. Uh, the Air Force put the moratorium on incineration of, of all the, when you did the triple rinse, they, aside from the, the incinerators not burning hot enough, one of the incineration uh, facilities was found to be dumping some of the waste uh, into the, the local stream, local tributaries up there, so they got busted for that. And that wasn't the first time they did it, so. 
uh, off-gassing of your chemicals, uh, like I said, when heated, whether it's in your bottles, uh, water bottles, your cookware, because in the Teflon, as it gets hot, those gases are getting into your food, getting out in the environment, uh, so you're inhaling it or you're ingesting it. That's the Coho's New York. Like I said, they got busted up there. Uh, they found it wasn't hot enough. Um, so 225 shipments, uh, 2.4 million pounds of H triple F and effluent. Most of it came from the military um, because they couldn't incinerate it. It's now sitting in a warehouse somewhere. Uh, so when you guys do the next swap out, all of the effluent is gonna go to that warehouse and sit there and collect dust until they figure out how to get rid of all of that effluent. And I think that's why they, they said, oh, we're just going to do the, the single rinse. So you don't have that much of flowing. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys have landfills around here? Yeah. So any of uh, the, the leachate from the, the unlined landfills, we've seen that. Um, so whatever products that you have in there, as it breaks down, if it's not lined, it leaches out into the groundwater, uh, local tributaries. We found... We found uh, firefighting foam barrels, uh, five gallon pails in, in landfills. Um, and so they just, they dump them out there. Uh, turnout gear, people dump in their turnout, you, know, it, you name it, it, it's in the landfills. Paper mills, uh, do, you, do you have any paper mills or had paper mills down here? Well, yeah. for maybe back in the back in the day. Back in the day, but not anymore. So we, we had yeah. one up in, <clears throat> we had one not too far from where I live up there. Uh, it used to be Hammer Mill, then it went International Paper, and they would create two, di two types of waste. Liquid waste and sludge. So as, the, the, as they're producing paper, there's a thin sheen that they put over top of the paper. That's PFAS, that's that surfactant to keep it water, water res you know, resistant. Um, otherwise, you know, paper's no good. They also were making the uh, food packaging products. So what they would what they would do is the liquid waste they would dump it out into the, the local stream, local creek. The sludge they would collect it, sell it off to you know, whoever would, would want to buy it. Um, so that's why a lot of these paper mills were known to produce toxic PFAS. You know, down in uh, Macon, Warner Robins, they got a paper mill, and they also got the uh, what was the cigarette company down there? Uh, we have a tile company that makes the ceiling tiles. Cilantro, there was a paper company, and uh, you know, Philip Morris. Anyway. Disney. Okay. No, not Disney. It was, it was a cigarette company. Mm. A, lot we of old, <clears throat> a lot of the old manufacturers around Probably here, with, with jean companies yeah. and stuff, they're all out of business. So they can move all their buildings have been converted into commercial to, uh, to oh, right. Right. residential well, and you know, small yeah. businesses underneath the residentials. You know, it's all. Yep. Yeah, all the old mills and the, yeah. yeah, there's an old mill in Canton that was a jean manufacturing and then they switched over to carpet and then they finally the building was too old so they shut it down. Yeah. Of course they the condos. I mean it's the same building they just put apartments inside. Yeah. Right now. Yep. Yeah, they're doing that up in up in PA and converting a lot of the old older buildings into that. Uh, like I said, yeah, here's firefighters, uh, Wilmington Fire Department. Um, so they're, they're wearing packs, no masks, so they're inhaling all those carcinogens. Uh, so who knows, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, they you know, develop something. Um, talked about this, fast food packaging. Are most food packaging, are they going away from that now? They claim they are, but again, you only hear about PFOS and PFOS. What are the other 11,998 yeah. products that they could be replacing it with? Um, so health risks. Again, that lifetime health advisory, as I said, it's a 70, a 70 kilogram, 150 pound guy. Uh, supposed to be able to drink two liters of drinking water each day for the rest of your life. It was 70 parts per trillion. They dropped it down uh, last year to 0 0.004. Uh, 
Um, that's actually nanogram per milliliter. That's that's not parts per trillion. That's what they're letting out of the plant now. Before of the of the water plant when they're shoving it out, they dropped it down. So now they're not letting more than that out, right? Well, they not necessarily. They they could be letting more more than that out. This is a the EPA's lifetime health advisory is only an advisory. There's no teeth behind it. There's no okay. There's no federal regulation. There's no enforcement of it. That's just, hey, this is what we, we recommend. It's up to each state to create an MCL. If you have an MCL that's established and has been passed with legislation, then that's where your enforcement comes into play. But the EPA, they're just an agency with, with no powers when it comes to this. So has Georgia done anything, do you know? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, again, these are the, the every uh, 4.8 years. Different regulations out there. Um, so for PFOA, disorders and diseases, uh, increased cholesterol levels, risk of kidney disease, suspected of causing cancer when it's heated like i said it, it emits toxic vapors of fluorine and for pfo the half-life is about 2.4 years pfhxa cancer and you're going to see cancer pop up in a lot of these harm to the immune system hormone disruption fetal growth child development uh, kidneys liver and what's what's crazy is that as I was in the military and I travel around, I would always say, you know, especially looking at the younger kids that had developmental disorders and everything, and we would always say, man, it's gotta be something in the water. It's gotta be something in the water that's causing this. Because especially, you look at the military, there's a high rate of developmental disorders with, with kids. And it's like, what is causing it? Could it be PFOS? Could it be something else? We don't know, but there's definitely well, something. Well, there's all kinds of shit in the water. No, maybe. Yeah. Yep. Gen X, uh, cancer, cholesterol, again, that uh, immune, su immune suppression. Uh, PFOS, type 2 diabetes, um, infertility in males, learning disabilities, nerve degeneration, thyroid diseases, cancer. So for me, since I have a high level of PFOS, I, I've got type 2 diabetes, uh, I've got nerve uh, degeneration. I've got uh, peripheral neuropathy uh, in my legs. Um, upper extremities is fine. Um, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, uh, a few other things. You, you know, it's it's associated with, with PFAS. So all all those like commercials you're seeing about suing, like who are they suing? They're going so, after 3M, Dupont, Chemours. Uh, okay. But they're doing it with a class action, and the problem with that is that everybody's gonna get four dollars. Pretty much, pretty much, if, if anything at all, if anything at all. Uh, you look at the the latest one; they went after uh, Dupont, I think 3M, um, the states. I think I think they allowed the states to sue the manufacturers for something. I, I forget what it was. But it comes down to like I think maybe like a hundred thousand dollars per state, you know, or you know, whatever, whatever plaintiff was on there. Yeah. The big one that was Dupont um, that robbed a lot. Uh, if you ever saw the movie Dark Waters, um, that was where Parkersburg, West Virginia. Dupont was a neighboring manufacturer. They were intentionally dumping all the, the PFOS into the, the local areas. Kids were out there playing, you know, swimming in it. There was a farmer, his cattle started dying off, he didn't know why, uh, they came in did the testing. Um, so Rob took on the case, uh, took about 20 years for them to get a settlement on that one. Uh, because of the number, pretty much everybody in the, in the town of Parkersburg sued, it was a class action. They got, on average, less than $100,000 uh, per plaintiff. Yeah. Some got more, some got less, depending. Yeah, they won't even cover medical bills. It, it would. Well, with that case, DuPont had to come in and provide medical care and treatment mm -hmm. for those that were affected. That was that was written in there. Uh, but that was only like a couple hundred million dollars. And it's like they make that probably about 30 seconds. Yeah. 
you know, because they're, they're a global company. It's, that's nothing for them. This latest one was like seven hundred and seven million dollars. No, actually, was it was it in the billions? I think it was like ten or twelve billion dollars. But again, that was that was nothing. They, they make that in a year. They'll just write off a year and say, okay, you know, no big deal. Um, so I, I, I tell people, you know, all the time, they're like, hey, Kevin, you know, I just saw this ad for you know, this class action. Should I join it? And I'm like, I'm not an attorney. I don't endorse any attorneys. I said, if you if you want to sue, do it individually. That's, it, it's going to take a little bit to do, but you're going to get all the money out of it. Yeah. I said, you know, because you look at these class actions, attorneys are get, they're going to get at least forty percent of that settlement. Yeah. They're the ones that make out, and then whatever's left. Um, you know, yep, yep. That, that's assuming the, the plaintiffs are still alive. Yeah, you know, that's so. Uh, PFES, more cancer. Uh, PFNA, asthma, uh, breast uh, cancer tumors. PFHPA, liver damage, immune system, diabetes. So blood testing, uh, 20 mandated that blood testing be offered, not given, offered. So active duty, those that were defined as a firefighter right there, someone whose primary job for military occupational specialty is being a firefighter. So again, all those Navy personnel that were supporting, they're not firefighters. Your fire truck mechanics, they're not firefighters. Your dispatchers, they're not firefighters. So this is another thing. So here, uh, perform during annual physical exam. If a firefighter misses the exam, they have to wait until the following year. There's no exemption. You can't walk in a month later and say, hey, I missed, you know, missed my PFAS test. No, they're gonna turn you away. If you have a firefighter that, and I've seen this uh, with active duty folks. So active duty firefighter, military firefighter, takes a cross trip over to, we'll say, recruiter. They're no longer, their primary job is no longer a firefighter, it's now a recruiter. They can't get blood tested for the next three, four years as a recruiter. Even though they know that PFAS is in their blood and they wanna monitor it every year to see if the levels are dropping, they're not eligible for blood test because it's not their primary job. Uh, veterans like myself were ineligible. So uh, when I, I had my, my blood tested the first time, um, I went through TRICARE. They came back as a non-detect. I thought I was getting this, the, the full six. They only tested for PFO. It's like, okay, come back as non-detect. I had Eurofins reach out to me. They were, they were doing a beta test of their new test kit. Sent me the test kit. They tested for like 42 different types of compounds. A bunch of them come back um, and that one did at home um, they found PFO in my blood elevated levels of PFO so it's like how did the military not find it but this third party lab did oh by the way they found other compounds in my body as well that's how I found out I had so much PFOS in my, in my system this is what the even the current uh, DOD blood test goes by the CDC NHANES study they're using that 95th percentile column, this one right here, as their, their, their results to you. So, you know, would you say you got like 20 for PFOS? Mm -hmm. So if you look at PFOS, um, very bottom, so you're just slightly over, they're 18.3. But if you go by the geometric mean, you're five times, nearly five times higher, rather than just just a, a slight elevation of the, the 95th. The ATSDR uses um, the GeoMean. My surveys, I use the GeoMean because it's, it's a more accurate number. Again, we use zero as the norm. I want the number closest to zero to say, hey, you're elevated. Again, these are the top five that come back for me. Um, so I'm over that geometric mean on four out of the five. And these aren't even anything close to the numbers I'm seeing. Firefighters reporting back. 
the DOD uh, just did a study on Air Force service members. They compared PFAS contamination to testicular cancer. So they tested, I think it was a few hundred uh, individuals. What they did, they found, and I'll send this, this, this report to you guys. They took individuals that were registered in the DOD system, cancer registry system, and then they compared those names with blood samples that were already collected. If you guys don't know, the, the DOD collects your blood every so often, stores it, there's like 10 million samples of, of blood um, that they have stored somewhere. So they took these individuals that were registered, found their blood sample, their initial blood sample, pulled that out, tested it for PFAS, and then they compared the two. They said, okay, there's Joe over here who's diagnosed with cancer, testicular cancer. Did he have PFAS in his blood when he first entered? No. Okay, well, what about, what other samples did he have throughout his career? So then they, they sampled those to see if PFAS showed up. And then a lot of them showed up, yeah, they had PFAS. And then they're like, okay, let's start comparing. Did PFAS contribute to tes testicular cancer? And the end result was yes. There's a, there's a likelihood, there's a risk that PFAS exposure contamination caused or was likely uh, the reason why they developed testicular cancer. So that, that's a study that just came out. That, that made national news. Uh, so my, my study that I did in 2021, not too long after I had my blood test done, the DOD IG came out and said, hey, we found the DOD itself has no intention to track, trend, or analyze the PFAS blood test results. So they're collecting all of your blood test results, handing back your results, said, hey, we have no idea what this means, good luck to you. And that's literally what a lot of firefighters have told me. The doctors slid their little result over to them, said, good luck, I have no idea what these numbers mean. <laughs> and it's like, that is the last thing you want to hear. That's you know, you know, yeah. what happened to us right yeah. there in that room, right yes. before World War, right after World War I, before World War for other show. It was a doctor, uh, whatever the master sergeant, and a chaplain, and, chaplain. and the MS, uh, in the uh, the BCD. Wow! And we went in one at a time. They handed us the, in the envelope, they opened it up. Go go see primary health care or wow. go ask an expert. Wow! That's that insane. It. See you later. Bye. Next. That's insane. Yeah. That's that's and, and that's why I'm fighting as I am pissing people off and heading out to Congress because that, that's got to change. And we were supposedly the first ones to get that detailed of a test by the by the military. Okay. Wow. Which I don't believe. But yeah. we were the first. Yeah. That they told us. Yeah. So, so I had I had 133. I put the survey out there, developed the survey. It was sort of vague at the time. Uh, I got a more in depth one now. Um, had 133 folks sign back, former active uh, military firefighters. Uh, and I took the same thing as what the CDC and Haynes study did. Uh, just looked at gender, age, ethnicity, and then I, I just wanted their PFAS results. I said, I don't want any, any names. I don't want to know where, you, where you're at, where you were. Keep it totally anonymous. So this is what I found with active firefighters. Of those 96 active, 87 and a half percent of them had elevated levels of PFH excess above the geometric mean that was up there. And that's probably due to foam, right? Very likely. Yeah. So your, your PFH excess and your PFOS, uh, probably because of the foam. Because of the foam, yeah. Yep. And then former firefighters, I had about 35 of them, about 74 and a half, give or take. Um, with PFH excess and 42 uh, PFOS. So again, you know, it's I had I had the numbers back home as to what was reported, uh, but again, these these numbers are, are high. Again, they're above zero. They should, they should be zero. But this is this is data the DoD was not tracking, trending, or analyzing. So it's like, what are you guys doing with with firefighters? How are you educating them? You know, if you get your blood test results back, your lipid panels and said, hey, Kev, you got high cholesterol, here's what your numbers are. Well, my doctor tells me, okay, diet, exercise, go on, you know, certain medication for it. There's a plan. With PFAS, there is no plan. Uh, and that's what's, that's what's scary, is that here's your results, good luck to you. <laughs> yeah, we don't know what they need either. Yeah, yep, next. 
So when I, when I wrap everybody up, uh, all firefighters, about 91, uh, almost 92% of all firefighters of those 133 had levels of PFH excess well above the geometric mean. So the National Academies recently came out, clinical guidance for follow-up. So this is what they recommend. So if you have higher than 20 nanogram per milliliter of PFAS, doesn't matter what uh, of PFAS, this is really what you should be, your, your doctor should be talking to you about or you should be um, doing yourself. Um, yeah, so you, you look at your lipids, uh, and this is something I, I tell firefighters, uh, really anybody, you know, when they do their, their PFAS, you know what your normal uh, health is, what your ever, you know, your, your, your general health is. If you see or you know, feel something's a little wonky, go see your doctor, and don't leave that office until um, until you have discussed it thoroughly. Um, you know, I was seeing when I retired, I was seeing a civilian doctor, even though I'm 100% uh, rated. Somebody convinced me and said, "Hey, you know, go to the VA." So I go up to the VA. Talk, I had to sit down with the doc. Um, as soon as I mentioned PFAS, he's like, oh yeah, I heard about that. I'm like, well, okay, do you know anything about it? No, not really. How much time do you got? So because I'm not leaving until you're educated on it. Because he was doing my initial you know, entry uh, for, the, for the VA and everything. And we sat there for about an hour and a half. Uh, he was not happy, sat there, and he, he had the balls to go ahead and say, um, well, I'm putting you down for low risk of to sick of cancer. I said, no, you're not. I said, you're going to put me down as high risk for any type of cancer. He's like, well, why would I do that? I said, because one, I'm a firefighter. We're exposed to who knows what. And two, with PFAS. I said, we are a, 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 we're way up here compared to the average citizen. I said, you should never put a firefighter as a low risk for any type of cancer. And uh, so, yeah, he got, he got a pretty good education that day. Um, like I said, it took an hour and a half, but, uh, but yeah, Firefighters tell me all the time, they walk in and it's the typical, oh, how do you feel today? And if they say, oh, I feel good, check the fire, okay, we'll see you in six yeah, months. Yeah, you never tell the VA you're okay. Never, never. never. Say that. They, they are there for you, yeah. and you, know, you and have to steer your own medical. Yeah, and they'll cut back your uh, your uh, disability. Yep, yep. Oh, you're, everything's fine now, okay, great. You don't need to be in the percentages. So this is two to 20 nanogram per milliliter. And again, like I said, I'll, I'll send this, these slides to you so you have them. I'll send you the actual National Academy's uh, report so you have the whole thing. Um, and that's just usual. What's the usual standard up here? I, I hate it when they do that. You know, what's usual? Usual for you guys may be different than what usual is for me. So it's... Uh, these are cancer rates in the fire service. I've talked to a lot of folks about I think you guys have probably seen me before. Again, 9% diagnosed, 14% death among firefighters. These are firefighters exposed, more recent, old school on the, on the right. Yeah, smoke breathers. Yep, you, know, you got a chief officer, white helmet there. Uh, I had the opportunity, <coughs> did a podcast, I interviewed Billy Goldfeder, and we talked about white helmets. He's like, at the end of the day, it's just white paint. He said, you know, the person underneath that helmet doesn't necessarily mean they're a leader. <coughs> so it's, you know, all of us have to be our own leaders. You know, so it's, <laughs> wow. Um, Hold on, let me make a note for you. Yeah. <laughs> this is my local fire department, volunteer fire department. I had a structure for us a couple years ago. Um, so there you got at least three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight firefighters in this building. Um, second floor is already compromised, they're up there, but this is, you know, the whackers, the volunteer fire service, they gotta get in there. Um, three guys below are wearing air packs, nobody's wearing an air pack up top, but yet they're sucking in toxins, you know, all because they gotta go ahead and, and do some overhaul and shit that's unsalvageable. That's it. You know. <laughs> Um, there's our Navy photos. LODDs, the IFF, you guys can see this with your union. Um, you know, they're saying about 75%, uh, 70% of LODDs are gonna be due to cancer. That's just the reality. Um, more numbers. So, 
this is something that changed last year. The IARC, um, um, just to let you know, they, they want to Zoom interview me at 12.30, so if you guys, you guys want to take lunch or whatever. Oh, that's fine, yeah, okay. whatever you got to do. Yeah, because they're just sticking around with this conference, so they want to interview me. So, um, so the IARC, uh, they changed this group. We used to be group two. Um, then it changes to group one. So it's when the strongest level of evidence that something can cause cancer exists. Group two is that it may or is likely to cause cancer. So because of all the research that's been going on, this group of experts uh, from eight different countries changed this to group one, which is huge. So when you go to your doctor, um, if you're diagnosed, Oh, we do. Okay. Um, if you go to your doctor and you're diagnosed with something, um, especially if you got cancer, refer to this. Uh, see if your doctor is aware of this and say, hey, uh, or if you're looking for the VA for benefits, say we're now a group one because the strongest evidence is out there that firefighting um, can cause cancer. So and what's the next duty do for you? Then they who? They'll, they'll basically pick up the check for the, your for your medical bills. If the, if the VA, if you get if you get uh, disability through the VA, you will. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, you guys are all civilians, right? Mm -hmm. You guys fall under the Fed firefighter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you guys know you got the Fed Firefighter Protection Act that passed. That right? just passed. Yeah. Just passed. So if you're diagnosed or you have any of those listed. In there, it's presumptive, it's presumed that your illness, cancer, or whatever, is because of your firefighting. Yeah, but what does that actually mean for us, though? Your your medical care, treatment, and everything should be you should be compensated for that. Okay. It's just, it should be covered. It should be covered by yes, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're currently dealing with the military right now. So you had two bills: the Fed firefighter, Mike Lee, seek military firefighter protection. Identical. They passed the Fed firefighter, sat on the military one. They've been sitting on that one for three years. We're trying to get that thing passed. I'm hoping it's either going to be passed this year or next year. Um, they're going to have hearings on it with Congress well, here pretty soon. All of us here are pretty much both, right? So we're all former military firefighters, and now we're. Yes. So I mean, we qualify for both, right? Because no, we're no. former military? Well, not all of us were former. Oh. No, they say you only, you can qualify for one. But yeah, you're not so, of the Fed Fire. Yeah, so if you're fed, if you're a Fed Firefighter right now, go to the Fed Firefighter. Okay. Yeah, because the, the VA is going to screw you over. Okay. Um, because yeah, we've only had maybe like four firefighters that got 100 percent rating um, through the VA, and it's taken years to get it done uh, through Nexus letters and, and some other things. So. Don't it, tell it, me about it. Yeah. Um, These are health cancer risks with firefighting. And the first time I showed these to Congress, they were like, well, I, I'm like, you've never seen these? They're like, no, I'm like, seriously? Uh, it's, they've been around for a while. Thyroid cancer is starting to pick up uh, within firefighters. 400% increase in absorption for every five degree increase in skin temperature. So as you're working out, you can window fire, uh, if you had structure fires around here, <laughs> your body heats up. So with every five degree increase, you got 400%, uh, every five degree temperature increase, you have a 400% uh, increase of absorbing those toxins. So think about your turnout gear. So as your body heats up five degrees, all of those toxins, whether it's, it's from firefighting or whether it's in the gear or getting wicked away into your skin, your uniforms, uh, all of that, and it's getting absorbed into you. So. I recently made the call that we won't do any training, helmet and gloves training. Okay. Uh, only unless it's live fire training or actual calls and emergencies. Awesome. So. Do you do exposure reports every time you wear a turnout gear? No. That's something I recommend doing because there's toxins 
in the gear from the manufacturing, um, or there's toxins. Even when you wash your gear, you're not getting your gear 100% clean. Um, so you're still wearing those toxins. Um, in res regards to your hoods, how many hoods do you guys have? Two. Two. Okay. Two little mix with it, yeah. Yeah, okay. A lot of departments only have one, so they're just they're wearing the same damn hood. Uh, they're not washing their hoods. Um, do you, you guys document every time you launder your, your PPE? We do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gear extractor. So, so with the gear extractor, um, Well, let's real quick talk about talk about uh, gear here. Uh, let me message you real quick. I'm almost done. 2015, if you guys are IFF, you probably heard of this study that they did. They put a firefighter full turnout gear, SCBA breathing, um, put them in an ionized room. Yeah, well, it's did it's it's outside the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was the results. It shows you where the individual's thyroid is. Uh, it's very likely some of this was cross contamination, but. Uh, just shows you your gear's not, you know, fully encapsulating. The particulates are going to get in. Um, so for the management, um, you know, we're starting to hear manufacturers are saying, oh, we have PFAS free turnout gear. There is no such thing. Like I said, it's in a moisture barrier. Um, Dr. Grant Beasley from Notre Dame University did a test. Um, if you've heard of Diane Cotter, uh, up in New England, her husband, Paul, he developed uh, testicular cancer. Uh, they figured it was because of the turnout gear. She talked to Graham Peasley, collected 30 sets of different turnout gear, brand new, used, washed, um, all different types, uh, sent swatches out to him. Uh, he tested it and they found samples um, and different samples you see there, they found PFAS in every one of them, uh, so much that he actually ordered his staff to wear medical grade gloves uh, because they don't want cross contamination on it. Jeez. Um, so that's the, the manufacturers, like the globe. That's just touching the gear. Well, that's that's the number of samples that they have. That's not the. Yeah. Um, it's uh, 12.30. I just messaged her, yeah, just to give me a few more. So I'm, I'm almost done here, so I just want to key in on this. Um, so what we found um, with laundering PPE, so when we follow NFPA 1851 guidelines, um, that's how they were, you know, obviously you're supposed to launder it that way. I recommend donning the nitrile gloves while handling the PPE, just like Grand Peasley did. Um, Pre-clean it. Make every effort to capture the effluent from the PPE cleaning equipment. That's going to change in the new 1851 standard. Thanks for that. What's happening, um, a lot of departments, they take the effluent and it goes down the sanitary sewer system. So while you're extracting all those carcinogens out of your gear, all that wastewater is going down the drain goes into the wastewater treatment facilities, they can't filter it out, it comes right back out of your tap. So it's just cycling right back. So because of all of this, 1851, the, the committee, uh, I submitted a public comment, said, hey, what do you guys think about this? Uh, I recommend we do a self-capture. They looked at it, discussed it, they, they went with it. Uh, so they're going to say, make every effort, um, I think, I, I, I had to go back and look at it. Um, make every effort to self-capture it, uh, but you gotta follow local, state, and federal laws on this. So this could have other changes to the laws to, to capture this. Uh, so the EPA, your DEP, uh, environmental protections at, at the local or the state level could end up changing. They're gonna, they're gonna flip out here. Just well, soon yeah. As soon as you capture that, how are we gonna get rid of it? That's the thing. So it's you know, did I? Did yeah, I, you know, environmental people are there. Yes. Yeah. So did I unleash the beast by, by doing this? You know, uh, and then it pulled yeah, up on it. Better for everybody in the long run, but they're just. Gonna, it is. It's gonna. So for for this this one here, this is the system I, I had the local guys set up. 
Um, they ended up going with the, uh, uh, who was that? The, the ready rack. They, this is supposed to be an extractor, it's, it's not. Um, they ordered the wrong damn thing. Um, oh, it is a glorified home washing machine. You know, it's rated as a, an extractor, but it's really not. So we have a hot water heater over here. You got the washing machine here. Got a three bay sink here to wash your masks and other garments. It comes down into a sump pump and pumps into 275 gallon uh, tote. The tote uh, was supposed to be set up uh, to where they could access a, a quick connect right here. But the, the guy that installed it ended up puncturing the top. There, there's a, a a cap right here. I wanted him to go through that so you could just unscrew it, but he ended up piercing the, the tank. So it was designed to where they could hook up a quick connect. The approved uh, company could come in, pump out the tank as needed, and then go from there. Uh, they found out initially it was going to be like $1,000 to pump out the tank. That was just the initial because they had to test it and everything to see what they're dealing with. And they said most likely the price will go down. So the fire department said, well, screw that. We're not, we're not paying, you know, thousand dollars. So what they ended up doing, there's a drain, stall drain right here. <laughs> so they took, put a quick connect hose, brought it out, dumped it in the stall drain. <laughs> stall drain goes into stormwater drain. Stormwater drain leads into a, a protected trout stream. It's a huge no-no in Pennsylvania. Substantial yeah, the violence. Size should go to the municipal water. It should, supply. but this building dates back to the early '50s when uh, they didn't have all those regulations back then. So, um, so yeah, the uh, the state's got wind of this. They're getting involved in it now. Um, so I told the fire department, I said, "Don't, don't dump it down the drain." They're like, "Yeah, we promise we won't." Sure enough, they're dumping it down the drain. So. Um, <laughs> These are some cancer prevention techniques in the firehouse. Of course, minimize unnecessary wear, um, shower within the hour, document everything. Every time you put your turnout gear on, you're exposed to the foam, um, you know, anything like that. Document, document, document on that. This is the Pennsylvania State Fire Academy policy. So when we go out and we do training, in order to reduce field contaminants now. Once you come out of the building, you will stand there. There'll be a positive pressure ventilation fan in front of you. You'll stand like this for 30 seconds, turn around, stand like this for 30 seconds to try to blow off all the contaminants. You'll immediately remove your gear. You'll either hang it up if you plan on going back in. If you don't, it goes into a plastic bag, goes into a container, never makes its way into the truck or into your personal vehicle. You'll go through a decon area, before you get into the, into the cab. Uh, so we're trying to practice the whole clean cab environment up there as well. A lot of, a lot of departments are pushing back on it and like, why do I gotta go through all this stuff? And it's like, well, so you don't cross contaminate anything, so. Uh, legislation, um, there's the VET PFAS Act, they're working on that. That was the Senate version, that's the House version. Um, the NDAA, believe it or not, there's prizes for development of a non-PFAS uh, containing turnout gear. So whoever develops that is going to get money from the federal government, plus they're going to get the contract. So they did the same thing with the phone. I think the prize was $5 million if you develop a non-formated phone. Yeah, they did, but they could do it with other kind of phones. Yeah. Um, so there you see beginning 1 October 2025, the SECDEF may not enter into a contract to procure a firefighter PPE uh, with intentionally added PFAS. Manufacturers, we already know they're going to come back and say we didn't know it was there. We didn't intentionally add it. Pennsylvania has similar legislation in there as well, uh, which we're working to, to get that change. Um, this, I think, was the Fed Firefighters Act. We're trying to get that 10 years changed uh, to life, yeah. 
Uh, they're doing the same thing in the military. And I told Representative Spanberger, uh, who's doing, who was doing the, the military one, um, I said, imagine that firefighter that's diagnosed 10 years in one day. Are you gonna look at that firefighter and say, oh, you missed it by a day, you're not eligible. You gotta change out that 10 year requirement, change it to um, this is Pennsylvania again, intentionally added PFAS chemical. This is a sticker that's out there. We need to change the culture, obviously. Um, stop putting skeletons out there. That's my contact info, but I'll, I'll get it on to you guys. That's my spiel. Um, Thanks for coming. Yeah, you guys got questions? I mean, I can. I can do this quick zoom zoom thing real quick and then answer questions if you guys want to you guys uh, have questions. I think that covered a lot for me. I mean I yeah. think you know, at least we know what to you know, a little more information about it and then yeah. what to the main question that I had was, okay, you got it and then so what do you need to do to make sure you're covered? Like detect so early detection basically is what you're recommending, right? You, you got you got to get your tested for pretty much everything right now. Yeah, get get your blood tested, establish your baselines, do it every year. You guys are entitled to get it every year. Don't don't turn it down. Believe it or not, there's firefighters that are turning it down. Um, and then get your cancer screens. Like get your every, cancer screen. Every cancer screen you can get. Basically, yep. Get yep. That done. If they push back and say, well, you know, you're not old enough or whatever, say, I don't care. That's what I was, so that's what I was talking about before. Like, so I'm gonna bring my sheet. Yeah. Like, I because mean, I was worried about insurance not covering those those um, tests. Yeah, and um, that's that's like, also going to change in the new NFPA standard. They're adding all these cancer screenings in there. So if you guys are following the uh, the medical NFPA standard, they've already put it in there. Uh, so the new the new version that's going to come out. Like, I think it's next year. Those cancer screens will be in there as part as part of the medical exam. Mm -hmm. So PFAS is an engineer. The blood testing's not in there, but all of your so part other of the cancer physical? screens are. What's that? That'll be part of the physical. Every, yes, the physical. As, as long as the DoD is following an PA. But they was last year they came out. The med folks said, "Oh, we're not following an PA standard. We're doing our own little thing." But I would push back. I would get with it takes years. Yeah, I would get with your DoD yeah, leadership. Yeah, shit out quick as anything yeah. like that will do. Yeah, get with, get with your DoD fire leadership and say, look, we need to do this because they just changed the standard. Because um, I guarantee the med folks are going to push back and be like, yeah, we're, we're not doing that. Really. Yeah, no. cost a lot more. Yeah. So I would, I would have your baselines with your, your PFAS. I would, once the NFPA standard comes out, I would carry that with you. Um, I would have the National Academy's recommendations, uh, that report with you, and then I'll get you the, um, when they change this from a cat two to a cat one. Mm -hmm. So walk in here with all of this documentation and say, this is why you need to do this. And when they push back, I would say, okay, I'm gonna go to, you know, I'm gonna go to the next, next higher up. Yeah, well, I was just gonna go through my civilian doctor, and that's yeah. that was the main yeah. thing is, is getting insurance to cover that yep. as, as a justification. And, um, as long as the doc refers it, yeah, then it should be covered. Should be so if you, can, if you can just show the doc, say, this is why I need to be tested. Because when I went to my civilian doctor and, and mentioned PFAS and told him the risks, he's like, oh, hell yeah, we gotta get you tested. Okay. He, was, he was all over it. And oh, it was, you know, so it was, it was covered by my insurance, my civilian insurance at the time, or TRICARE. But, and they, they covered it, but now VA, VA doesn't do blood testing, so. I'm not gonna go to the VA. Yeah, don't go to the VA. I mean, if you guys have civilian doctors.